How satisfying is timber framing? It's, I would say the most satisfying <laughs> of building methods. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back for part two of the dry kiln series. This video will show a lot of the process involved in building this timber frame shed, which we're using as a hopper for our fuel in our dry kiln. So as I mentioned in part one, my goal is to eliminate wood waste, or more so, put our wood waste to good use. In anticipation of this build, I started chipping about a year ago. That pile of chips has since built up to the point where it's out of control, and that's really putting the pressure on me to finish this build. So without going into too much detail, I'll give you a recap of what we have so far. We've got a 40 foot long sea can, some fancy green machinery, and a cement footing. Now we need a shed adjacent to the sea can that will hold a decent supply of wood chips. So before jumping straight into building something, it's almost always a good idea to do a little bit of design work. Let's start with the top view of the sea can. So the first step is to partition the shipping container in half. So I've got 25 feet of space tied up in the dry kiln. That leaves 12 feet by the time you've factored in the wall thickness for the boiler room. And it's eight feet across. So based on the positioning of the door and the size of the boiler, plus all the minimum distances that I needed to meet, the location that the boiler had to go was right here. I'll cover this boiler in more detail in a different video, but all you really need to know for now is that the boiler has an auger feed that drives in here and then another auger feed that pulls in from here. And then there's a big gearbox. And it has two arms on it. And then those arms spin around and around and move material. So that determines exactly the size of the shed that we need to build. Basically we need 10 feet spacing between these four posts. Now at this point I could have just built a nice stick frame shed, thrown it up, but instead I decided to make it fancy. And I started throwing around timbers and maybe adding a few braces and then I read a timber framing book and I came up with my own design. At this point I've totally forgotten the only parameter that actually matters that's that the walls are 10 feet apart. Besides overbuilding the whole shed, I did resolve a couple of issues by rotating the shed 90 degrees and then realizing that I had to offset all the joints in order to make the tenons work. And that's basically all the information that I needed to get started actually building this thing. Timber framing is made up mostly of mortise and tenon joints, so you have a slot that's called the mortise and then a male part that goes into that called a tenon and these mortises are probably the biggest time sink as far as construction is concerned. Uh, they have a special tool for that called a chain mortisizer in timber framing and I looked into the price tag of those and I was dissuaded from buying it. I'm using an auger bit in combination with a high torque electric drill that's achieving most of the material removed to a set depth and then I have to clean up that mortise with a chisel and I have a nice high quality inch and a half wide timber framing chisel. This basically eats up most of the time in the construction process. assembly went quite smoothly other than I messed up one of my measurements on my posts and I had a mortise that was off by about six inches or so. You can actually see it there on the left if you look close. The upper cross members on the structure have a 
milled angle built into them so that all I had to do was chisel out a notch on the rafters and they would perch and set into the beams I'm just using structural wood screws to secure them down. Looks like Mike already has a little warm-up station going here, a little chip, wood chip burner. It's working pretty good. Okay, so the rafters are actually looking pretty good other than they're covered with a little fine sheet of snow. But I think what I'll do before I put the sheeting on is I'm actually gonna work on this uh, this key. So I've done all the other ones so far. So this here, see that? Um, if you look here, the actual joint is dovetailed. So there's a hollow tapered joint in here and this beam sits down in here and then you add this key up here which is a tapered um, tapered one side and then flat piece of wood and you pound it in here with the hammer and it, what it does is it spreads the, the joint like this and it tightens everything up so there's a little bit of it's a little bit of movement still in the building probably because I haven't done this one and that one over there plus I still have yet to peg all the joints so once I do all that it should kind of firm up a little bit so I'm gonna build these real quick on the table saw Okay, I'll just to test fit these guys. Should be tight. Oh yeah. A little too tight maybe. That's better. So I took care of this little edge here, so it should be a little bit closer to square. Snug is good though, snug is good. So I chose a piece of cottonwood for this uh, because it's a hardwood. Stuff's decently hard. I can maybe just barely get it with my fingernail, just barely. So it's decently hard and uh, it's dry. So this piece is nice and dry. So what's gonna happen is the building, which is a little bit more moist, has higher water content, is gonna shrink and it will tighten up on this uh, peg block. We call this a wedge. It'll tighten up on the wedge and uh, just make the building a lot more rigid. This one's a little tighter. It's just 
Yeah, a little bit tight at the top. So what you can do in that situation is take your hammer and you just uh, you beat down this edge and kind of squish it, squish some material. And then uh, it should go in there. Okay, so now I got all these rafters that are uneven. I don't know if you can see that, but they kind of like move around there. So what I'm gonna do, so I'll just measure from here out, go about 11 inches, and then I'll get a foot of overhang with the, uh, with the fascia board, roughly. Let's try a foot, just see what that looks like. Decided to go for a full strap method so the whole roof gets covered. Makes it easier to walk on. Time for tin. Actually, I don't recommend doing tin in the wind, but uh, it was gonna rain or snow or something, and I didn't wanna be up there after that, trying to do tin with like ice on the roof. So I decided to get it done before the weather came in. Okay, it looks pretty good, but we need to put some pegs in at all the joints and then I can take those straps off. Let's get to it. There's a deer right there.
most satisfying is timber framing. It's, I would say, the most satisfying <laughs> of building methods. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get leverage on a building with one hand. As with everything else in this build, I'm going to use waste wood products. I have a large supply of rejected piano wood. So this is basically lumber at this point, but it's vertical grain orientation. So it looks kind of neat if you put it in a siding that's full two inch, but it's super green. So over the next couple of months, I expect it's going to shrink. So I'm trying to allow for that as I install it using short spans and smaller segments. So the gaps aren't as noticeable. And then for the large sections of wall, I'm going to do floating walls so that the siding can shrink and then I can just fill it in with an extra plug at the top as it dries out. Oh my goodness. That's not good. I think I need to drain this.
Have a look at that door. Barn door style. Looks pretty good. Decided to make it uh, independent, two independent doors so you can have, say you want to chip into this building, you could have the bottom one closed and then open it up and then you could chip in. It's coming. Just got to fill all those holes at the bottom now. That's next.